There have been many great painters throughout China's history, but few of their works have survived to the present day. Warfare, defacement, and other factors in the murk of the past have rendered them lost to the ages. Until the discoveries made at Mogao Caves, an art museum hidden away in the desert. In these caves, we have found 45,000 square meters of well-preserved frescoes created in a period of over 1,000 years. Between the 4th and 14th centuries, these artists remain anonymous to us, but left behind them valuable historic artwork. History has left behind little recordings of their lives. As such, we can only piece together the traces of information about their existence from the frescoes and documents found in Dunhuang. Here is one such artist by the name of Shi Xiaoyu. His bare bones biography is based on research by experts piercing together clues. His name appears on the western wall of the number three cave at Mogao, next to a fresco named the Thousand-Handed Guanyin of Sahai. Some have determined that the frescoes of that cave were drawn by Xiaoyu, but others believe that he was just a tourist from the Yuan dynasty who left behind some graffiti. In the following story, we shall borrow his tale in order to fill in the history of the magnificent artwork of these ancient caves. Let us go back in time to 1351 AD. Earlier this year, Shi Xiaoyi had moved from Ganzhou to Dunhuang. At this time, this trade hub was under the administration of Prince Suleiman of Xining, a member of the Yuan Dynasty's royal family. Suleiman was a fervent Buddhist. Under his guidance, Buddhism became the dominant religion for the area's residents. The six most common written languages of Dunhuang at that time were Chinese, Shisha, Fazgba, Uyghur, Sanskrit, and Tibetan. The stele of Suleiman, which is now stored in the Dunhuang Institute, consists of inscriptions of the mantra Om Mani Padre Hum, written in these six languages. The stele was financed by Suleiman in 1348 AD, and three years later, on Suleiman's orders, the imperial family temple located in the middle of the Mogao cliffside experienced its first major renovation. On that east-facing cliff, hundreds of caves were connected by wooden stairs and pathways. These caves of the Thousand Buddha dotted the yellow cliffside like an oversized honeycomb. Under the planning of his fellow craftsmen, Shi Xiaoyu was filled with expectation about his new work site. Depictions of the monks of the old can be found whilst wandering around these ancient caves. The murals that Shi Xiaoyu saw would have been the earliest frescoes preserved at the Mogao Caves. The construction of the Mogao Caves began to aid the monks in their meditations they must help the meditating monks to achieve a state of enlightenment and serenity. The decorations found in the caves must aid this goal. 
These early murals all depicted events that happened in Buddha's life. According to Buddhist teachings, the founder, Sakyamuni, sacrificed and endured much suffering before achieving enlightenment and Buddhahood. In one story, while serving his realm, the prince Mahasattva chanced upon several tigers on the brink of starvation and decided to feed himself to them. However, by this point the tigers had lost all their strength due to the hunger and were unable to devour him. They were only able to survive after the prince pierced his own neck with a bamboo spear then jumped off of a cliff, thus allowing the tigers to gain nourishment from his freshly spilled blood. After doing so, they regained enough of their strength to devour his corpse. These early frescoes, dating from the era now referred to as the Northern Southern Dynasties, were unwittingly seen by the just arrived Shi Xiaoyu. At that time, China's northern regions were in a constant state of low-intensity conflict. With such instability, China's culture faced its first major Shinzim. The long-suffering population sought comfort in the promises of peace in the face of their suffering promised by Buddhism. It was in this time that Buddhism first began to flourish in China. The caves, which began as strictly meditation areas, gradually became the center of Buddhist activity as temples were established around them. Mogao Caves became a pilgrimage destination along the Silk Road. The frescoes drawn inside the caves Aside from depicting the activities of the past, Buddha before he ascended now began to depict the present Buddha, Sakyamuni and his exploits. This is the chronicles of Sakyamuni from he was born until he ascended into Buddhahood. This is the story of how the influence of Buddhism convinced 500 irredeemable bandits to lay down their arms in that instant convert. These easily understood drawings depicting the glories of Buddha and Bodhisattvas, helping the less knowledgeable converts to understand the teachings of the faith. But what drew Xiaoyu's attention was not the moving tales that the drawings depicted, but the craftsmanship of the art itself. The people depicted in these murals were generally drawn as half-naked and in their visages were seldom emotional. Rather, their countenances often did not radiated an aura of solemnity and mystery. This style of art was one that never before had been known to the central Chinese plains. An experienced artist would have recognized this style which uses contrasting shades of colors to bewilder and amaze its viewers. This style, known as in the art history world, has been known to Dunhuang for several centuries. This is a photograph of the fresco taken in April of 2007. Due to 1,000 years of weathering, the then bewildering array of pigments has eroded to more muddled mess. The lines have become splotched. This image has become a shadow of its former splendor. This type of artistic style originated in India. When Buddhism first spread to China, 
The Chinese probably didn't know about Buddhist sculptures, uh, Buddhist frescoes, and so on. So when those things spread eastward in the wake of Buddhism, the techniques were transferred simultaneously. So in the early Buddhist frescoes, we could see those Indian and Central Asian countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan. Those styles are really present in the frescoes. These imported styles ushered in new vitality for traditional Chinese artwork. Following the frenzy of cave construction, Chinese artistic styles began to blend in. In the 6th century AD, a group of artisans from Luoyang put on their own spin on Mogao's cave murals. Facing these fresh-faced bodhisattvas, Shi Xiaoyu began to feel more and more distant from India and Central Asia and a little closer to his homeland. Those images adopted the Chinese style of noble elegance, skinny bodies, flowing clothes, natural eyes and lips. This type of elegance was signature look of the great artists of China's southern dynasty. Chinese clothing and cultures, as well as the flavor of the southern masters, became the new norm of the Mogao Caves. During the Yuan Dynasty of Shi Xiaoyu's lifetime, Dunhuang has lost its former prominence. But in a time like this, an irredeemable trip, and a monk on his way, coming to a city just like this, stemming from India, Greece, Persia, all of the culture and its civilization has come together for thousands of years. As today, all of these rocks and caves are like the magnificence of all of the Mogao caves. After the workers completed cleaning up the imperial family's temple, they added new murals to the structure's walls. As far as researchers understand, designing the layout of the new murals was a very lucrative and popular business. These sketches brought to France by Paul Pelliot are blueprints used by Tang era craftsmen for the designs of Dunhuang's murals. The drafting, color coordination, and even inscription of the accolades, each had specialized craftsmen dedicated to each task. All in all, the large murals seen at Dunhuang each required tremendous amounts of work, requiring months or even years worth of time to finish each one. The workers are underfed, underclothed, and prone to diseases. Normally, they had two meals a day, breakfast and dinner. Breakfast was a wheat-based item called boto, while dinner was generally two he pancakes. The he refers to the way that the cakes were made, 
The modern day equivalent would be what is called Nan in Xinjiang, or what Han Chinese called Wubing. The workers of the Mogao Caves led harsh and lonely lives. At any given time, they were working under any number of great artists. But this fact did not change their sad fates. A short poem found within the Dunhuang manuscripts reflected their conditions. Craftsmen can learn if they're willing, but their body is enslaved, wedded to the government. This is the Cave of Veneration, one of the largest caves of Mogao. As the abbot of the imperial temple made his introduction to the cave, Shi Xiaoyu noticed that the frescoes decorating the cave's walls were no longer of the storytelling style fashionable during the northern and southern dynasties, but instead the same sutra paintings like what he and his colleagues were designing. These frescoes, called sutra paintings, used images to explain the concepts found in certain sutras. This painting is a Tang era depiction of Buddhism's western pure land, where Amitabha is said to reside. The pure land, also known as the western paradise, is said to be a land of plenty, which is filled with joy and devoid of suffering. In order to depict this marvelous land, the artists filled the painting with beautiful scenes fitting of such a description. The reason for doing this is pretty simple. The concept of a paradise where every day is filled with music and leisure is a very attractive prospect for anyone. By promising this paradise as a reward for diligently following the tenets of Buddhism, the temples were able to effectively conduct PR and conversions at the same time. These sutra paintings were a unique innovation of Chinese society which was experiencing a period of social stability and individual enrichment. The divisions of the northern and southern dynasties ended when the Sui dynasty finally conquered all of China. In the following Tang dynasty, Chinese society entered a golden age. During that time period, the popularity of Buddhism reached previously unparalleled heights. This surge in popularity also led to the diversification of Buddhist thought, giving birth to sutra paintings as an art style. As he passed by these awe-inspiring murals of the mighty Tang dynasty, Shi Xiaoyu got a feeling for the past era's splendor. The people's expectations for a beautiful afterlife were all reflected in each and every artistic heaven, courtesy of the craftsman's predecessors. Once the pure land concept was introduced during the tongue, it remained deeply ingrained in the public's subconscious of the 1,055 sutra frescoes preserved in the Mogao Caves, over half have the pure land as their subject. Due to the belief that the Bodhisattva Guanyin could help people to escape the world's suffering, Guanyin's worship was very popular during the Tang. It was such a phenomenon that in everyday life, every household chanted the sutras. Every family worshipped Guanyin. 
No matter if it's the traveling merchant encountering bandits, the prisoner about to face his execution, or the sea captain trapped in a storm, all prayed to Guan Yin. According to the Lotus Sutra, when faced with any of the 33 dangers, so long as you besought Guan Yin, her will would manifest itself to save you. Because there were no guidelines, no prior examples for sutra paintings, the artist's creativity became its greatest inspiration. The scenes of familiar everyday life became a large part of those frescoes. It is also because of artistic license that the originally masculine Guan Yin became feminine in appearance. This is the most beautiful depiction of Guan Yin in the Mogao Caves. She is demure and elegant, rivaling in all attractiveness to one of Tang's courtiers. The painting's cave is consequently known as the Cave of Beauty. In AD 713, Tang Xuanzong changed the year name to Kaiyuan, ushering the Tang into the prosperous Kaiyuan era. The master artist Wu Daozi, whom Shi Xiaoyu holds in high regard, lived and worked during this era. Daozi's superbly detailed art style was given the moniker Wu Dai Dengfeng. Under his skilled brush, subjects gained form and flow this painting, a Vima Lakirti, in Cave 103, carries this famous artistic flourish. Vima Lakirti is one of ancient India's Buddhist lay practitioners. Despite not devoting his life to meditation, he was well versed in Buddhist teachings. This sutra mural depicts him in heated debate with the Bodhisattva of wisdom. Manjushri. Vimala Kirti was greatly admired by the educated officials of Chinese society, so his visage in Chinese art has adopted their appearance and attire. As one can see, Chinese culture has constantly and gradually undergone change and melding to take on this new interpretation. Faced with this myriad of sutra paintings, Shi Xiaoyu was filled with a sense of curiosity. These murals chronicled the development of Buddhism in East Asia, yet none of them contained a hint at their creators. Just who was responsible for creating these ancient murals? Throughout the ages, the Mogao Caves has been an important spiritual site for local Buddhists, but to people like Shi Xiaoyu, the caves were a massive art gallery. One centuries in the making. Everywhere one traveled in these colorful caves, one could glimpse the shadow of the great ancient masters. Li Sixun was a master artist who lived during the High Tang. His watercolor landscapes were well known throughout the land. His influence is reflected in these Mogao murals, which have taken on aspects of his artistic style.
The layout of Chinese artwork has been filled under the category of scattered point perspective by art historians. However, these Tang era murals allow its viewers to adopt a focused perspective. They use a psychological trick in which the images on their edges are aligned in a straight line with the central axis, creating a line which the human eye naturally flows. In the West, this technique only emerged during the Renaissance, over 600 years later. This linear perspective is the main technique of Chinese artwork. From his start, Shi Xiaoyu did his utmost to use this technique to capture the majesty of life. The Mogao Caves project was his best chance to showcase the lessons that he learned. The wild bison and boars that leap out of these frescoes were born from the skilled hands of artists from the Western Way. This portrait of Vimalakirti from the Sui dynasty is an example of a line-based drawing. Penmanship is a paramount, as it should be. In art history terms, this is a sparse style. Shi Xiaoyu obtained a lot of experience on various drawing techniques from the detailed art left behind by his ancient predecessors. But while he was looking at all this work, he began to think, were all of these paintings done by the local artists? Or some of them done by artists closer to home? Judging from historical records, during the Suetang period, famous artists and craftsmen all engaged in mural work. The temples of Luoyang and Chang'an bore their handiwork proudly. Those frescoes became their performance stage. This is the city of Xi'an in Shanxi province. This former dynastic capital is still a bustling city. However, the traces of the former master's work has long since vanished in the fires of war. The relationship between Da Huang and Chai'an has been very close from the North-South dynasties to the Sui dynasty. Thus, much of the artwork in Dan Huang can be said to be the same quality of that as in Central China. There isn't much artwork from that era present in Central China nowadays, but there is a lot of it in Dan Huang. So, if one wishes to learn about the development of art before the Song Dynasty, Dan Huang's fresco is an absolute must-see. This is the Mogao Caves in 2007. These workers from the Dunhuang Institute are currently preserving a fresco that is over 1,500 years old. In the painting, the Buddha's clothes flow like water. This is the famed Cao Yi exiting the water. These great works of art, long thought to be lost to history have been perfectly preserved by seemingly nameless craftsmen on the walls. The knowledge of our forefathers and the sophisticated culture of Buddhism have been passed down to the present in these works of art. Thousands of years of artistic technique have been wholly preserved in this place, completely overwhelming Shi Xiaoyu's expectations. He then made up his mind to stay Hopefully one day he too will make his mark on the Mogao walls. Over a period of more than a thousand years, 
The popularity of the Mogao Caves drew in large numbers of artists and craftsmen to ply their trade. Their techniques, passed from master to apprentice, remained there from generation to generation to be shown on the walls. While painting on those walls, the artists' arms were suspended in the air. Without any support, their shoulders and arms had to have phenomenal endurance in order to maintain steady hands. In the darkness of the caves, under those conditions, they still managed to create such amazing work. Regardless, these murals are scores of centuries old. How do they maintain their color? These are tools that the Dunhuang craftsmen of the Tang Dynasty used to make their paints. Now stored in the Dunhuang Museum, at the top of the stone pillars, we can still see traces of red pigment. Tests have revealed that the pigment is inorganic in nature. As it turns out, the murals of Dunhuang gain their color from natural minerals like cinnabar, malachite, and mica. In addition, other pigments were imported from outside the empire for additional colors. These are color palettes from the Five Dynasties era, and the blue paint they used made from lapis azuli. Lapis azuli, which has a beautiful sky blue hue, is a gemstone that is produced in modern day Afghanistan. These mineral pigments are stable pigments that corrode when subjected to sunlight and moisture. Mogao's frescoes were able to remain a vibrant paradise of Buddhist thought through the large-scale application of these substances. However, when compared to a splendor and colorful pastel of the Tang Imperial Court, Shi Xiaowei prefers the elegant culture of central China. Zhao Mengtian, Huang Gongwang, and Ni Zhan were some of China's most famous artists. Their artwork exemplified the old virtues simple, humble, novel, carefree, and set the ancient world standards of evenness and delicacy. Shi Xiaoyu always held these Chinese artistic values close to his heart. This is Dunhuang's Yulin Grottoes, which bears the nickname Gorge of the Thousand Buddhas. Its fresco Saman Tabara transformation has been called the best of the ancient landscape paintings. The mountain ranges, rock formations, courtyards, and pagodas depicted in the paintings are half shrouded by ever-present mist and clouds. Whether judging by the painting's layout, the depiction of its subjects, or the usage of its medium, this work has earned its reputation. Even when compared to great artists in central China, the technique of Dunhuang's craftsmen remains impressive. However, this kind of art was seen less and less upon Dunhuang's walls ever since the coming of the Song Dynasty. During the Yuan Dynasty, the ambitious conquests of the Mogao Khans pushed the empire's borders outwards to Southeast Asia and the coasts of the Mediterranean. Commerce also became primarily maritime in nature. The Gansu Corridor lost much of its importance. 
New activity at the Mogao Caves slowed to a trickle. Shi Xiaoyu, who had waited in Dunhuang for six years, saw not a single chance to make his mark upon the caves. This lasted until 1357 AD, due to the decline of the Yuan Dynasty. The peasants of China began to revolt against their foreign masters, and the fires of war slowly spread to Dunhuang. The spring of that year, maybe as a prayer for peace, a new cave was excavated at Mogao. Just like that, Shi Xiaoyu got his wish to make his mark. This is the northern border of Mogao's southern region. This winding path was the only path passing through the ancient Mogao caves. Shi Xiaoyu plied his trade in the number three cave next to the entrance. Every day, Shi Xiaoyu worked on the fresco in his mind's eye on that cave's wall as soon as the first rays of sunlight arrived at the Mogao Caves. In order to best mimic the image as it appeared on paper, Xiaoyu drew and colored on the walls before the plaster even finished drying. Afterwards, he used all of the techniques that he had learned from the ancient works to depict the flowing wind-swept clothing of his subject and seamlessly capture every bit of body, form, and emotion. Now, we can feel the depth of Shi Xiaoyu's passion behind the lines and color of this fresco. Behind the inscrutable expression of the Guan Yin, there lies a beautiful vision. In 1368, Zhu Yuanzhang's rebel army captured the Yuan capital of Dadu, bringing an end to the Yuan dynasty. Four years later, the Ming general Feng Sheng established the border fort of Jiayuanguan. At the Gansu Corridor, excluding Dunhuang from the boundaries of the empire, the formerly bustling trade hub was turned into a grazing land. The name Shi Xiaoyu and the murals of the Mogao Caves were forgotten in the shifting sands. This is the northern region of the Mogao Caves. Here in 1945, archaeologists discovered some human remains. They guessed that it was an artist who had died of overwork. Who was he and what did he draw? No one could know for certain. This is the number three cave. It is a small cave and sealed all year round, closed to tourists. Very few people know that this cave contains the most valued fresco of the Mogao Cave. However, 
the academic world confidently say whether it is the handiwork of Shi Xiaoyu. By the 80s, the faint words by Gan Zhou's Shi Xiaoyu have long disappeared from the western wall of the cave, but the other remains of his work is still the cause of much conjecture as to his real identity. I humbly beseech the merciful Guan Yin, asking of the Four Mercies, listen to these three requests. In the modern era of the 21st century, the art galleries of stone caves left by the old nameless masters has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site as well as a place of pilgrimage for artists. Because of these new visitors, the ancient lifestyles of Dunhuang, its Silk Road commerce and arts and cultures have been given a new life.